Well, I decided to change things up a little bit on a Friday morning. We're not going to have Patrick Bond after 7 o'clock. We're going to talk to him uh, right now. It's off the big news out of the UK with local ramifications. Glencore has been ordered to pay penalties of over £280 million. You do the conversion, that's around 5.7 billion rand. It's in connection with their corruption in parts of Africa. The global mining giant had already admitted to five counts of bribery and two counts of failure to prevent bribery uh, under the UK Bribery Act. So let's bring into the conversation uh, political economist, Professor Patrick Bond, uh, and uh, head over to him to get his thoughts on. First of all, uh, Prof, good to have you with us. We'll talk about the uh, comments from Brian Molefe earlier in the year and the connection of the now president and his former connections at Glencore. We'll get there in a second. First of all, just your immediate reaction to a fine that size. Uh, it's again a shame that it's the British and not African countries that are uh, prosecuting, especially Nigeria, Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, uh, the Ivory Coast, and maybe most tragically, South Sudan. The, the revelations from Britain are that within hours of South Sudan in 2011 becoming a government, the uh, corruption began. And it involved even uh, very quickly these guys flying with private jets um, with lots of cash right into Juba, the, the capital of, of South Sudan, and, and, and starting the bribery so they could get these oil contracts from, from South Sudan. This is just one of the ways in which I think uh, uh, we owe the North for having begun prosecutions. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the U.S., you recall, uh, in July was activated against uh, Glencore, and they paid $1.5 billion fine. But, you know, this is trivial, ultimately. It's tragic that Africans aren't getting the money mm -hmm. because it was, uh, it was this continent's governments. But it's also trivial um, for Glencore. This year, I suspect they'll have $20 billion in profits, double last year's, because of the high coal price and, and other commodity prices. So we need to work much harder, especially because Glencore has its second listing here in Johannesburg on the JSC. That's quite right, and we want to talk about that JSC and uh, the listing and other connections as well, Prof. What I'm going to do, ask you to stay with me for a second because uh, we're going to set up my next question. We're going to talk about Brian Molefe and the connections of the now president of our country, ANC President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, and his former position at Glencore. But let me just give you some context here uh, as well while we do that. We're going to take you back to the state capture inquiry. The former ESCOM CEO, Brian Molefe, had a lot to say about Glencore. Here is what he had to say at uh, the State Capture Inquiry. Glencore did shed some light as to how they had put themselves in that precarious situation out of which they were demanding to be rescued by ESCO. <clears throat> Glencore did not sign the contract that you refer to. Glencore bought the contract with the company that had signed the contract. This is in the evidence of Mr. Efron before this commission, and it was on the 13th of January. Uh, uh, sorry, it was. Yeah, it was on the 13th of January 2020 that he gave this evidence that they had bought that company together with the SCA. CSA, Coal Supply Agreement. Although Mr. Efron is a chartered accountant, he admitted that Glencore did not conduct a due diligence on Optimum prior to the acquisition of the company and the contract. Nor had they bothered to acquaint themselves with how the Coal Supply Agreement worked. This was in page three of his statement. Sorry, in, pa in page three of his statement. Instead of conducting due diligence and understanding how the coal supply agreement worked, they did something extraordinary, Chairperson. They sold 9.64% of the shares in the newly acquired company to Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa a political heavyweight, and made him chairman of the newly acquired company. That was a strategic decision to use the former Secretary General of the African National Congress and former Secretary General of the National Union of Mine Workers, a member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC at the time. They knew 
that the profitability of the company could only come from a successful renegotiation of the coal price and ignoring by ESCO of the penalties that were accumulating at the time. Mr. Ram. So a lot from the former ESCOM CEO, Brian Molefe. Professor Bond, let me just pick up on, I'm not sure if you were able to hear everything Brian Molefe was able to say, but I want to pick up on one key comment. Ramaphosa was their bet. How damaging is this for the president? It's been a, an issue since not only Brian Molefe, but um, others have said that the uh, special deals that ESCOM was prepared to do with Glencore back in 2014 when uh, then Deputy President Ramaphosa headed up the um, energy war room to try to fix ESCOM, that those were too favorable. And as Brian Molefe uh, was pointing out, no, whether or not he's trustworthy remains to be seen. He's under prosecution, of course, for his own role in the Guptas. But he was the head of ESCOM and pointed out that uh, they were paying very high prices after having a longer term contract that, uh, as he argues, I think probably correctly, Glencore had taken this huge mine, uh, Optimum, and um, actually not done due gil diligence, and they were losing money on it. And uh, it was much more profitable at the time to export that, that coal. And I think it's in that sense that if Ramaphosa has a rebuttal, which is, no, no, I got rid of my Optimum shares shortly after I became deputy president in 2014. The final sale of his own company, Shanduka, which held those shares, was only in 2016. Um, he sold it to a very close business associate, Petuma and Schlecker. So we still really don't know the extent to which President Ramaphosa was his, uh, acting in the public interest versus uh, mm. his historic interest, which was connected to, to Glencore. Glencore, don't forget, had been this apartheid oil sanctions buster. And it was well known that they were doing very dodgy deals. There was uh, an Israeli tycoon in the DRC, uh, Dan Gertler, who uh, the then head of uh, Glencore, uh, Ivan Glassenberg from Johannesburg, uh, was uh, very enmeshed with and under prosecution. So President Ramaphosa's business dealings, not just there, but uh, we know about Longman and the problems that led to the Maracana um, massacre. Many questions about what he did to become so wealthy. And I, I would add another one is simply coal itself. And that's where Glencore retains four major mines here. They have about 17,000 employees in, in coal, Ferro allies. They're going to get the, um, the Altron Cape Town refinery up and running again. It's a major company and it, it really begs the question, what uh, capacity have we got in South Africa when President Ramaphosa was, was very loyal to Glencore uh, to actually prosecute and to join the British, to join uh, the US, even to join Brazil in taking on this, this behemoth, the, the, the world's largest commodity trader, one of the biggest companies in the world with, with massive profits this year. And you took the, the next question out of our mouth, Professor. I was going to ask about uh, the critics now suggesting that the lack of investigation, the lack of uh, conviction as well is going to come from the fact there was this link back in the day. Very briefly, Prof, if you don't mind, uh, do you see any kind of formal investigation into Glencore, as you mentioned earlier, still part of the uh, JSC listings? Look, I was wrong about a couple of things we talked about before, which was Bain, you know, which, which went unprosecuted until a couple of weeks ago, or mm. and now it's tossed out, or um, uh, Stein uh, Hoff, right, and Marcus Huster with all of his money, that was just taken, or um, Tongat Hewlett, which has gone into sort of a bankruptcy. I've been wrong in thinking they just got away with it. And I think one reason is that this um, pending grey listing of South Africa because of so much corporate corruption and financial fraud and illicit financial flows. That might be scaring our authorities, and I really hope so, because it is time to take what has been rated by PwC as the world's most corrupt corporate elite during the 2010s and, and clean them up. And I think it's a sentiment a lot of people are now sharing when you hear the word grey listing. Professor, I thank you so very much for your time as always, a political economist, uh, economist Professor Patrick Bond. Uh, sharing the sentiment as well, because when the word grey listing first came out, uh, many people thought, well, not much is going to come of this. It's uh, part of the Reserve Bank uh, language, and no one really worries about that. But as the prof says, now that it was a very real threat, we've seen a lot more action when it comes to corporate corruption. My thanks to uh, Patrick Bond. Uh, we are back. In